say amen for him as he comes. Thank you. Good evening. Yeah. Uh, we thought that y'all had canceled Bible study, but we found out you, well, we found out you haven't. Uh, Sister Jacobs, good to see you. Glad, glad to, yes. Um, I said the old saying is you can't do any better than you know to do. And so we're here tonight to, to hey, Curtis, we're here tonight to have Bible study, yeah. to have Bible study. Um, and so, Jane, what I realized today is, because most people are miserable, most people not making any difference how much money you get, no matter how much stuff, we got more stuff than we ever had. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. most of us got plenty to eat, yeah. roof over our head, better roof than what, you know, always getting and never satisfied. Yeah. Never satisfied. And, and, and the problem is, is our focus. And when I say our, I'm talking about me too. Because uh, everybody has the same problem. Yeah. And the focus, so much time, Curtis, if you're not careful, you'll put the focus on yourself. Yeah. Instead of putting the focus on God. You, I've even heard people say, uh, uh, you just, you gone too far. Uh, you just, you, you don't take all that. Uh, whatever, but you'll never get in trouble about putting your focus on God, yeah. because even after you have praised Him, once a person said that that if I had ten thousand tongues, I couldn't praise Him enough. But the problem comes when I begin to become self-conscious, when I look at myself, even our failures and what we've been through, and the fact that I didn't stand up, and well, that's why you're not the Savior. The only thing that we provide God is sin. Mm -hmm. That's all we provide him is sin. And that's all that we can because Paul says that within my members I find another law. Uh, another book I read says that even at my best I'm still the author of confusion. And I, I just continue, Brother Davis, to amaze myself because evidently I must have got some confidence in myself because, because I, I disappoint myself. It's like, dog, I didn't think I would do that. But why, why are you placing your confidence in yourself anyway? Uh, so it's good to be here because it's something about human beings, Robert, that we have to learn the same thing over and over again. Yeah. We have to learn the same lesson over and over again, a lot of them. And so I'm glad to be here. We, we have this book. Uh, somebody got one? Okay, that, this book right here, and I guess I do it for the, for the uh, video as well. Romans, a concise commentary, Marianne Manley. And if you don't have a copy, just let us know. Uh, we have uh, some more on the way for per people who, who ordered them. And I, I don't think that any time that you put a good book in a person's hand that you're wasting money. You're not wasting money with... with uh, so then uh, we're grateful that God provides where that we could have this uh, uh, book uh, in order to learn more about him. Not necessarily studying a book as we are, but the scriptures, because whatever in the book, if it doesn't back up, if it isn't backed up by the scripture, then it's no good for us. Paul's epistle to the Romans. I have to introduce this, and that's because this way God gave it to me, Lady Deborah. We're not going to jump right into Romans, but we're going to take our time. We're going to go through all 16 chapters, but we're going to take our time. Since you've been over here, have you heard it said over and over again that you should be reading Romans through Philemon? You've heard that. Romans through Philemon. And what we're going to look at before we get to Romans tonight, because why is it so important for a a member of the body of Christ to know what's in Romans through Philemon. Well, what's the difference between Romans through Philemon and Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? And Leah's, what I was taught was, was the, the writing in red. Now you really need it because Jesus said that. Jesus said that. So this is what I'm going to follow, this right here. And so uh, what is it about Paul and his writing that's so important to the body of Christ? What is the difference between the body of Christ and the nation of Israel? Because, Sheila, if you like me, I looked at all that stuff that was over in the Old Testament like it was, ooh, ooh. 
And then God said to the nation of Israel, you are holy people. You are separate people. You are my people. And they had all of these and the thou's over there. And I thought, I said, surely this right here, this is just as holy as it can be. Uh, the prophets, uh, Isaiah, uh, 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 Jeremiah, those prophets over there. Why is there a difference between what Jeremiah and Isaiah said and what Paul says? Even deeper, why does it matter once that I leave Malachi and get over into Matthew and my Bible says New Testament, shouldn't I be following everything now? I understand that I'm not in the Old Testament about eating shellfish and wearing garments of two, two different fabrics. I understand that. But now that I'm over into the New Testament, shouldn't I be able to rely solely upon? It's a bad thing when you ain't following no instruction, but it's even worse when you think you're following the right instructions and you end up at the same place that a person ain't following no instruction. And that's, 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 I, that's part of the reason in church right now. Because, let me tell you something, we, you, we are results-oriented. We are results-oriented. God made us like that. You ever been, somebody told you, said, try this kind of washing powder right here, do this right here, and you tried it, and you got the results that you were looking, couldn't nobody give you no more washing powder. So no, I wash, no, I wash his mind in tide. I don't want you keep that right there. That's how I wash mine over here. Well, when you get results, then you know, you know for yourself. Well, what we were using over there in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John wasn't working for us. We would knock and the door wouldn't be open. We would speak those things and it still wouldn't change. We'd go lay hands on the sick and our loved one would die. It just wasn't working. And that's the reason that Paul told Timothy, he said, study. And that's what people don't want to do. And I understand that because studying is hard work. It's a whole lot easier to come in here and jump and holler and, and get up and just say general things that don't mean, you know, you don't you get no understanding. It's hard to do that than to actually sit down in a chair and to be taught by somebody that has studied in order to teach you. But you know what? When you get to the place that you're tired of where you are and you want something different, you'll do what you need to do in order to get it. You got to get tired yourself. You see what I'm saying? Nobody gonna stumble up on a good house, a good marriage. You got to work. You got to work. And that's the reason I ain't all tore up about all these $50,000 wedding folk wanna have and bringing in the singles and all that. When you get through with that, you still got to put in the work to have a marriage. And marriage is hard work. So it is with studying, studying the word of God. But God would not give us a word if he did not want us to know what it means. So then we're ready to buckle down and I always told you, if ain't no Bible, me and you. This is what I'm going to do. I can't do, once your eyes could open, I can't do that other thing no more. Just going and clapping my hands and jumping and shouting and talking, my God is good. I can't do that no more. If somebody else can, God bless them. But I can't. I want to get an understanding. I want to take the focus off of me. And I want to put the focus on God. Because every time, I always disappoint. Am I the only one? I always disappoint myself when my focus is on me. But whenever I focus, I'm happy right now, whenever I focus on God, then I begin to get free. Then I begin to get an understanding. And so we want to understand tonight the 13 epistles that Paul wrote, Romans through Philemon. What are they? Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, uh, what that was, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Titus, uh, and then Philemon. Those 13 epistles, the reason they are important, because they were written to you. They were written to you. And we're going to look tonight so we can get an understanding, because we're getting ready to start to embark upon Paul's epistles. Now, Romans wasn't the first epistle that Paul wrote, but it is the foundation, because if you don't understand Romans, you don't understand being a member of the body of Christ. And I was confused because I was trying to follow Israel's rules. Yeah. Instead of getting my own marching orders, what am I? Who am I? If you don't know who you are, you don't know how you're supposed to act. Thank God for some home training. Because I found myself in some ditches. I found myself in some places. And then I remembered I'm a blame. I had a mother and a father who taught me certain things. And this is not. But I'm in the ditch. But the ditch ain't in me. The ditch ain't in me. And therefore, I can move. I can, get, I can do better. 
And so by following Paul's uh, teaching, uh, we don't have to know Paul's teaching, uh, Sister Jacobs, in order to get saved. Because why? Because we find out in Paul's writing that God does this on his own. We find out that God, you don't qualify. You don't, and that's the difference between us and Israel because in order for Israel to get God's blessings, they had to qualify for them. But we are up under a new different program, a new dispensation. And on this dispensation, it's based upon grace, purely grace. And so therefore, up under grace, man has no reason to boast. And he can say, God just gave me what he wanted me to have. I didn't deserve it. You know, it's one thing to say it. I learned that in church, how to be real humble and talk about it's just the grace of God. But when you don't understand it, you just ain't doing nothing but talking. You know that we learn how to talk in church in order to impress folk. We learn what to say. But the thing about it is when the real troubles, when that storm come through you, I'm talking about something you care about, your children or your husband or your house or what a real woman, a real woman place her house above everything. A real woman will live through embarrassment. She'll live through whatever y'all got to say. I'm going to keep my house together. Would to God there were more women that were real women. You a real woman, you hold to where you at. Because the Bible says that, look here, they said a wise woman build a house, but a foolish woman tear it down. Don't you let nobody, go. don't you join in with, I don't care how bad your house is. Don't you join in with nobody else talking about it. That's right, because God is able. God, God is able. I don't care what nothing is going, God is able. God is able. I found this out, Deacon Murray, you got to wait on him. I found out you got to wait on him. You got to put your little pride in your pocket. Tears in your eyes. You say, God, I know you can. I believe you will. I believe you will. Let's go to the next slide there. First thing I have to understand is why we are placing so much emphasis on Paul's writings is because Paul was given something which was called a mystery. Some of y'all, I know Jean, ain't no tell how many mystery novels she got at her house and stuff like that. And you know, a mystery, I ain't never really cared nothing about them, but no mystery or whatever. But a mystery is just something that wasn't known. Yeah. It's a mystery. We don't know. We just don't know. Now, what's prophecy? Prophecy is where God speaks through somebody and he tells something that wasn't known, but when it's prophesied, then you do know it. And that's what the works of name some of the prophets. Who was the prophet? Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, jo Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Zechariah, Zephaniah. These, are, these were prophets. These were mouthpieces for God. And these things were known from the prophets. But now it's a difference when your message is known. What you're talking about is something that's known. And then another person whose message is not. It's been hid from man. God knew it because God knew all things. But God hid it from man. But now the prophetic things, he did not hide that from man. He had man to speak. The problem was, Sheila, man didn't believe it. You know, faith come by hearing, hearing the word of God. And the prophets, they spoke, but the people didn't want to hear it. Just like today, most folks don't want to know the truth. They just want you to speak what they, what they believe and what they want to hear, whatever. They, they don't want the truth. Thank God that, you, that, you, that God will bless you to get desperate enough to accept the truth. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that you got, you, I got desperate enough. I ain't no better than you, but I just got, I got a good enough whooping. Well, okay, God, yes, whatever you say, not how I want it to be. So you have a difference with the prophecy versus mystery. This is how you learn how to rightly divide your Bible. Many of y'all might get somebody in here just like me that I always believed in having a Bible. I just didn't read it. I always believed in that. You know, and I mess around and take it, especially when the rough storm's going through. I take it and lay, and lay it over the pillow and open it up. I might open it up to Psalm 91. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> you, you see? And that's the reason that Paul was told, when Paul went into Athens, he walked and he saw that they had statues and monuments to all kind of gods. You see, people serving all kind of things, all kind of gods. And then they, they, they were so superstitious, and that's where the word religious come from. The word religious means superstitious. You just think what you're doing is going to bring you a better result. And so they were so religious, uh, 
uh, uh, brother, brother Wright, that they had one set up there, Brother Davis, that said, to the unknown God. To the unknown God. Give me that. That's Acts 17. You take that down and put Acts 17 up there. I got to go with spiritually. Acts 17. Go down about the end, I guess. 22. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, You men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are too superstitious. We ain't been number superstitious, Lee. We ain't know what we're talking about. We ain't read no Bible. We ain't buckled down or nothing. And people talk about you. You see, you with a Bible. You, any of y'all ever been through this side here? You Maybe you're on your job and you pull your Bible out you want to read. What you doing? You preaching now? <laughs> they shame you where you don't never pull it out no more. You must be, you must be a preacher, ain't you? Because you're reading the Bible. Because you, cause you want to know. But everybody want to talk about God, but you don't want to do no study. Yeah. And it's a crazy thing that folks, that, you got more ignorant people trying to teach folks. But I'm taking a stand for that. If once I find out you don't know what you're talking about, I'm going to tell you. You need to go try to talk to somebody because you don't know what you're talking about. You don't know what you're talking about. And I come to realize George King is, man, I'm getting up going to work every day. Ain't nobody giving me nothing. They feed me. Now, how come I can't go on stand up? I told y'all I'm a recovering people pleaser. You see? Well, you, you just go. You know you're going against what you know, and you know you're going against what's best for you. And I always tell men, you really need to stand up because you got a woman and some children that's looking to you. I don't, I don't care how smart that woman is. I don't care how good she can handle money. She ain't going no further than that man. She ain't going no further because she'll try to stand up and they give her this award and give her that award. But as soon as they find out who, they hug, who, who her husband is, she has to hold her head down. She has to hold her head down. And so then, if we do better, then we will allow those who are attached to us to live a better life. You only get one. And so the balance of our life, we ought to be dedicated to in order to trying to make those who are attached to us have a better life. Isn't that right? Amen. Look what he says. For as I passed by and behold your devotion, I found an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God, whom therefore you ignorantly worship. How can you ignorantly worship? That's an oxymoron. Because worship means that I know who you are and I give you your value. But if I'm ignorant of you, that means I'm not giving you your value. Every one of us have had someone that we were attached to who did not know who we were. And they had no choice but to mishandle and misuse us. Some of them even come back later and begged our pardon and say, I'm sorry, I just didn't know. I just didn't know. He said, you ignorantly, him, God is real, but you just ignorantly worshiping him. You know, I tell you all the time, I want, a, I, I want a blessing a lazy man can't have. And I don't push a particular version of the Bible, but, I, but I'm going to tell you what, y'all what, King James Version is the best thing for you. Because he, the King James Version is the only one that tells you to study. The other ones have put other words in there and whatever. You got to study to show yourself approved. If you got to trick the devil, come to Bible study. At least at Bible study, you open the Bible up. Put the Bible in the restroom. You're gonna have to go to the restroom. You can pick, pick, open it up then. Because we all are so caught up and we all are so busy just trying to keep things in order. Him whom therefore you ignorantly worship, him declare unto you, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, Dwelleth not in temples with their hands, neither is worship with men hand. You see, you know, they come with this. Stuff. Come on now, let's come on. Let's worship the Lord. Let's worship the Lord with giving now. God ain't worship with your hands. God ain't gonna see a dime of that. What y'all taking up? Quit lying. Quit lying. I'm gonna tell you what happened when people find out you lying to them. They don't trust you no more. If they ever find out that you're lying to them, they do not trust you no more. So he says here. Oh, and have made of, a, of one blood all nations 
uh, of men for to dwell on the face of earth and have determined the times before pounded and the bounds of their habitation that they should seek the Lord if happily they may fill out him and may find him though he be not far from every one of us for in him we live and move and have our being let's go back to the PowerPoint we're gonna move quickly through this introduction but we want to find out why do we need to study Romans why because I'm gonna tell you the Bible says you ought to be ready at all times to give an answer for what you believe with the stuttering and stuff like that. I never wanted to pastor no ignorant folk, but in order for you to know, I got to teach. I got to teach. And it takes time to teach. It's so easy just to move over. You got it? Okay, prior to Paul's epistles, what do we have prior to Paul's epistles? We got Genesis through uh, Acts. Genesis through Acts. Okay, over here in the beginning, God's plan for restoration. And you got to remember that everything is, is geared toward God restoring us. We lost out. Where? In the garden. We lost out. We lost uh, our connection with God. We lost our uh, union with God. And so God has a plan to restore us, to bring us, to reconcile us, to bring us back in communion with God. And so what God did was he made a plan that was based upon blood. Everything has always been placed upon blood. Adam and them decided they were going to uh, take fur and cover themselves. And that's, that's an analogy of religion. We try to do stuff to, to cover us. And that's the reason we love our rituals and we love our robes and we love all this stuff that we do trying to cover us up and to make us look like we are righteous. And that's the reason that it so hurts so bad when, when even all that stuff y'all got, we find out that you still, you nasty. You see, there is no righteousness except Christ Jesus. We don't have our, that other, other stuff is filthy rags. But the righteousness of Christ, when we get that, but we only get that by faith. You see, everything that you get from God, you get it by faith. You don't get it by working. You don't get it by working. You get it by believing God. Where you are now is because you believe God. Everything that you did didn't come to nothing until you began to believe God. And once you begin to believe God, stuff just fell right in line. So now, what happens is, is that man, he has man, and... Uh, Man becomes more and more evil. God says, I'm going to destroy man. And he has, he has the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the flood. And at the flood, he finds one person, that's uh, Noah, who Noah is still sacrificing the blood. He, so he found favor with, he found grace with him. So Noah, his wife, Ham, Jim, Japheth, three boys and their wives, eight people were saved. But then even on the other end of that, they still became more and more wicked. So then in like 2000 B.C., God decided, I'm going to work, through, I'm going to bring the, the uh, I'm going to bring uh, the Messiah through Abraham, through, yeah, through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, then the, the 12 tribes, and then which tribe was it that Jesus came through? The tribe of Judah. And so God had a plan, and it was to come through, first starting with Abraham. And Abraham got his righteousness how? Abraham believed God, and God counted it to him, imputed it to him. God gave it to him. Because you believe me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you righteousness. That's how he became righteous. And so then man, his nation decided they wanted the law. They wanted rules. So he gave them the rules. And then after the, the, with the law, he, they had the prophets. And, and they kept prophesying. They kept talking about the king was coming. Then when we get to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John over there, then the king shows up. In the person of who? Jesus Christ. And he, he has all of the, the attributes and the signs of the king. And that's the reason, you know what, Sister Chandler, I didn't understand what was going on with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I thought that's how we're supposed to be. They kept telling us that when y'all get right, you're going to be able to do what they did over there in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You're going to be able to open up blinded eyes. you open. I didn't know that this was all still up under the law and that this was the, prop, the Messiah who had been promised. And so uh, this, was pro this was prophecy. Was this the mystery? Was the mystery over here? No, all of these things had up been told from the, from, when, uh, from the beginning of time they had talked about. Even in Genesis uh, 3.15, I think he talked, God uh, said that he is going to bruise your heel and, and you're going to, what, bruise his head. This was the Messiah that was coming. And so Israel should have known him. Should have known him. 
But you see, the thing about God is you have to stay sensitive to God. So you can't get God. If you into yourself, you don't know nothing about God. But, but, but if you, if you, when you get to the place that you are poor yourself, when you get to the place that you really know how nasty you are, that's when you quit looking at yourself and you begin to look at God. And when you look at God, and that's the reason people can't understand sometimes how God using him. I know he did this. I know he did that. Well, the thing about it is he has recognized who he is. And so he, now he's not looking at himself, but he's looking to God. You see, one reason we can't get nothing done in church now, people look too good. They got too much going on. As a matter of fact, we said that, he, that God ain't blessing you if you ain't got this kind of car, if you ain't wearing these kind of clothes, if you ain't this and, and, and you ain't that. But that, that's, that's not even who God, God deals with them a poor of spirit, a contrite heart. God deals with broken folk. With broken folks, if, if you ever have met God, and, and it was at a time when, when you, you were broken. It was at a time when you, you just about felt like you were about to lose your mind. And then God came in and, at, at that time. So then Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they announced the Savior, that he was coming. And when he got here, he did those things. Now, the funny thing about it is, I like this right here, Lady Deborah. When John saw him, John was baptizing. And you must understand that John was baptizing them, which was a symbol of repentance. They need to stop placing their faith in themselves and look to, to the Savior, the Messiah, that was coming. And that's the reason that John said, when he asked them to baptize, he said, no, I'm, you don't need no baptizing or nothing. See, and, and he told him, he said, suffer it to be so for righteousness sake. You see, in order for him to die for us, he had to perfectly keep the law. He had to do everything. He had to be circumcised the eighth day. He had to go to the feast. You see, he had to do everything up under the law. He said, think not that I come to destroy the law. I come to fulfill the law. He took the law to the cross so that it could die, so it put it out the way, so that we could be married to another. The law has been put away. Now, we don't have to be married to the law. We're married to him. He, he is our savior. And so the funny thing about it is, even though John knew who he was, when John got in trouble, and I want you to know, I need that passage there, because I'm tell you what, I'm a strong, I'm a pastor, I'm all this right here, but the right storm can come through, brother. The right storm can come through, and it seems like I don't even believe in the Lord. And John will put in prison, and John called his wife and said, look, go, go ask him, is he really who, who I say he was? Well, you the one telling everybody else who he was. But he, he didn't do that. Jesus didn't, you know, Jesus knows what's in us. And, and what he said was, he said, you know, there's that, that nobody no greater. There's never been a prophet no greater than John. And so what he did was he went and opened up some deaf ears. He opened some blinded eyes. He said, go tell John what you see. See, because John's going to know. He's going to know that, that only the Messiah, when he gets here, will be able to do this. And he gave this power to his apostles so that they would have credibility when they went different places. He allowed them. Everybody couldn't do it, but he gave that to his 12 apostles, the, the ability to, to raise the dead and to open blinded eyes. And so all of this happened in Matthew, Mark, uh, Luke, and John. And so then he has the cross and, and he dies. And after the cross and his resurrection, we have another book. And now what's the name of that book? The book of Acts. Can we find our doctrine in the book of Acts? We can't find our doctrine in the book of Acts because in Acts, they are still up under the law. They are still following. They're still going to the temple. They're still zealous of the law. They're still up under the same program that they have been up under. So what happens is God is still offering them the kingdom. He's still offering them the kingdom. What is the kingdom? Because now, you remember over in Acts, the third chapter, when, when the apostles, the 12 apostles, the message that they preached, and in order to understand the Bible, you got to be able to differentiate the messages that the different people are preaching. The 12 preached a different message than what Paul preached. Paul preached to us, to the body of Christ. The 12, even after Jesus had died in Acts, the third chapter, he told them to repent. To, and we take that because we don't know. We take that to mean is to become sorry and don't, and don't drink no more. But that's not what it means. It's come from a Greek word, metanoia, which means to change your mind, change your thinking. He said the Messiah has been here. Now, what was the prophecy about? Prophecy was about the Messiah. 
He starts over here and it goes all the way over to these 13 books and he's telling him, read it. He's talking about a Messiah that's coming and when he comes, he's going to restore. He's going to be a king and a Messiah. The king, he's going to sit on the throne in Jerusalem and he's going to be just. Sit on the throne of David forever. And he's going to be the Messiah. He's going to bring man back into right relationship with God. But now, man, everybody wasn't the same. Because Israel was the apple of God's eye. And so he said, I'm going to make you a kingdom of priests. In order for you to get to God, you first had to go through Israel. You had to go through Israel. And that was the message that the 12 preached. And they preached that y'all even at the first beginning of Acts. That's what they was preaching. Jesus done come, he's been crucified, he's been resurrected. They're still up under the law and they're still what they're teaching. They're still teaching a prophetic program. He said, now, now, they did not say, read your Bible in Acts. They did not say, believe on the death, burial, resurrection, the blood of Jesus, believe that and then you'll be saved and you'll go to heaven. That was never a promise in the Old Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and even uh, in the early Acts about anybody having, going to heaven. They had eternal life, but their life was to live here on earth with Jesus as the king. Because Israel is God's earthly people, but the body of Christ is God's heavenly people. He said, in Philippians, he said, your conversation is in heaven. In Colossians, he said, set your affection on things above. Well, right now, if you are a believer, you are seated together with Christ in heavenly places. When you believe the gospel that Paul preached, then you are baptized out of uh, this old man Adam and you are baptized into Christ. If you are in Christ, that means that you were crucified, you were buried, and then you were resurrected with him in the newness of life found in Ephesians and in Colossians. But not only was he resurrected, but he ascended to sit on the right hand of the Father. And the Bible says that we are seated together with him. This is the mystery. This is what nobody ever knew. Nobody ever thought that this could happen. We, we, you were supposed to have to go through Israel. There, there was nothing about going to heaven and ruling and reigning in heaven. This is the mystery. And in order for me to read my Bible and to understand it, and in order for me to know who I am. Ain't you been doing better since you found out who you were? Ain't you been doing better once you actually, don't you every now and then when you, when, when, because people will do you so dirty. I tell folks this all the time and everything, I don't fool with people. I love people, I, I help people, but I don't hang with people. Because people are so messy and they're so petty. People are petty, I'm, I'm telling you. And so I don't do that in order, Van Jr., for me not to get bitter. Because you, you get to fooling with people. I, I'm I ain't talking about folks you don't know. I'm talking about people that you know and people that you helping, people that you love, whether it's your family or whoever it is. You get to fooling with them and you'll get distracted. You, you'll get distracted. You'll get to where well, you'll make that statement to all of me. I ain't fooling with none of them. Thank you, Jesus. And so you have to stay in that frame where you know what, God, because of the love of God that shed not brought through the Holy Ghost, we help everybody. We help people. But all that stuff with hanging with them and doing like that, if you ain't very careful. Because people don't, they don't, the natural man don't receive the things of the Spirit of God. And God has called us to be spiritual people. God has called us not to lean to our own understanding, but in all our ways acknowledge him. Well then, if you're a person who's led by the Spirit of God, you're different. You're different. You're different. You're different because this world tells you to don't think about yourself. This world tells you, take about yourself. They don't care nothing about nobody. The only time you hear from folks is when they want something. How many folks fool with you when they don't want nothing? You, you see? I mean, that, and that's okay. That's okay. But you see, thank God, God gives you an understanding. You don't have to walk around all, all your life ignorant. God will give you an understanding where you are no thing folks don't think you know. You see? And it's not you, but it's Christ in you. That's when Paul said, I can do all things. I can do all things. And if you can, if you, if you can navigate around this world without getting bitter, God got to be leading you. God got to be leading you because it's enough. I don't even have to ask your business or nothing like that, but it's enough been done to you last month for you not to even fool none of us no more. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. So then, the apostles, the apostles, this is their message. They told them to repent 
and be baptized and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Well, you got some people, the Jesus only folks, the Pentecostals, they done took that for their doctrine. And that's the reason that you got to be, if you don't get baptized in Jesus' name, you ain't saved. And they sincere, but they're not rightly dividing the word of God. These folks, that was all Israel. You're not going to find none of us over here. That was all Israel. He was still telling, it's right, it's Bible, but it wasn't to us. Everything that was written to us will help us. And, you, and it's found right in here in these 13 books, Romans through Philemon, and we're getting ready to get into Romans. And when we get into Romans, we can see where, God, this is what I've been thirsty for for all my life. You see, because God puts a thirst within you for him. And don't nothing else satisfy it's just a reasonable facsimile. I remember when I was little, they used to say, well, you can send in a box top or a reasonable facsimile. But a reasonable facsimile, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Y'all can have Christianity. I want Jesus. Because some of this Christian stuff and this thing, the way y'all treat folks and the way y'all look past certain folks and all that stuff, that, you can have that. But Jesus... He's the one that went hung, bled, and died for me. And the thing about it is, Christ in me, the hope of glory. When I allow Christ to rule, reign, and abide within me, oh my God, my life gets wonderful. But when I lean to myself and get in my feelings and whatever, thank you, Jesus. So now, they looked at the cross and they said, they told the leaders, they said, you have taken the prince of life and you don't put him up on the cross. Do you see how that message is different from Paul's message? Paul over in Galatians 6 said, God forbid that I should glory in anything but the cross. That's all Paul talked about, Brother David. In them 13 books, boy, he talked about the cross because he said it was, it was the cross. What we sang said, at the cross, at the where I first. So thank God for see what Paul message talk about. He had to go. He had to hang, he had to bleed, he had to die. He purchased my redemption. But you see, the 12 apostles, they was not looking. They were looking for the kingdom. And so they wanted the king, and they said, look at here. If y'all will repent, the leaders. You know, the Bible said the leaders of Israel called the people to, to, to go astray. He said, if the leaders, if y'all would repent, Jesus will come back and set up the kingdom. But they wouldn't do it. And Acts the seventh chapter was the last straw when they rejected the Holy Spirit. And Luke 11 talks about, said that if you blaspheme against the Father and the Son, you'll find forgiveness. But if you blaspheme against the Holy Ghost, there's no, problem, no, no, no place for you. And so in Acts 7, when they, when they stoned Stephen, that was the last straw right there. And the Bible says that even, and now after, at this time, in the timetable, at this time, after that Israel had finally rejected their king, then the tribulation was supposed to come in. The tribulation is kind of y'all like a cleaning. The tribulation was when God, God going to come in. That's the, you know, all the revelation about the battle of Armageddon. He going to come in and he going to cleanse all rebellion. He going to put down everything. You remember Jesus? He said, he, my, my God told me to sit here at the right hand until you make my enemy my footstool. Everything that exalts itself against God will be cleansed in the tribulation. And only a portion going to make it through the tribulation. And that what was getting ready to happen. And it was so bad because Jesus was sitting on the right hand of the Father. But read Acts the seventh chapter. Uh, uh, Stephen says he looked into heaven. Yes. And he said, I saw Jesus standing. He's standing. It kind of like me. I could be sitting down. One of y'all put your hand on my child. I'm going to stand up. <laughs> Bleed that. Bleed that. He said, Jesus, he would both be sitting, but he stood up. And when he stood up, he was supposed to bring in the wrath. But I'm going to tell you what God did. He had mercy. mercy. He had mercy. mercy. He had mercy. And it was one man that was standing there, the Apostle Paul. He was sawed in, and he was holding the clothes of them while they stoned Stephen. And God chose him. said, that's the one I'm going to save right there. The most unlikely, the most unworthy, the most, <laughs> I'm going to take him. And he caught him in Acts 9 on the, on the road to uh, Damascus. And there on the road, he, he, he told him, he said, Paul, it's hard to kick against the priest. And Paul knew that, he knew that, 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 that this must be God. Ain't nobody else. He's got to be God. And he asked, who, is, who art thou, Lord? Who is God? I thought I knew God. I've been learning religion and all this. And, and Jesus, he said, I'm Jesus. The same Jesus that you persecuting. The same Jesus that you killing folks that call on my name. I'm, I'm God. And it changed his life. 
He gave Paul. He sent him out three and a half years out on the, in the Arabian desert. And progressively, he gave him what's called the mystery. Why is it the mystery? When you read your Bible, you'll find out this which was hid before the foundation of the world. God is so good, y'all, that God make a way for you before you ever had a problem. Before, before you ever, whatever the problem is, before you ever get the problem, yeah. he already figured it out already b before that. And he already knew that man was going to come here and man was going to give dominion over and all this and, and whatever. He knew man was not going to be able to keep the law or whatever. And he knew that Israel was going to fight. He took Israel and set them aside. Yeah. Yeah. Where Israel had been chosen and the people, you had to go through Israel. Now, when Paul brings his message, Paul said, now there's no difference between Jew and the Gentile. We're all the same. You got to come. And we're not, you're not saved by your works. Uh, give me Romans 4. Give me Romans 4. You see, they had a works based, but, but still, Vanna Jr., everybody that was saved was saved with the blood of Jesus. They didn't, they didn't know. Romans 3 talks about it's kind of like it was in layaway. That salvation was waiting on Christ to die and once that Christ died and that's the reason nobody went to heaven until he did. see that's the reason they call Jesus the first fruits of them that died nobody went before them but they were kept in a compartment Luke's the 16 chapter they were kept in a compartment over there in paradise in the bosom of Abraham but the Bible says that he took captivity captive and gave gifts unto men and when Christ went down into the underworld and defeated Satan and the grave that he took those that had been held captive waiting on his blood. You see, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. I got you right there. Look what the Bible says here in verse 5. Look at the difference between Paul's. And we're finna get into Romans. And it's right here. This is what set Martin Luther, uh, the, the, the Martin Luther free. Martin Luther was a man that loved God, but he couldn't figure out how come he couldn't live right. You ever been there? You ever been there? How come God that I can't make my actions coincide with my heart? Yeah. No, I got a heart for you. And what Abraham, what, what Martin Luther, I read some things about him in 17, I think it was 1700. What he did, would do, Lady Deborah, was is that he was so disappointed in himself that he would go outside. He was in Germany, and they say it get cold in Germany. But they say he, he would go outside, and he'd lay outside, and he would try to punish himself to make himself act better and to make himself do what God said and nothing. And so then he took a journey off to some place to talk to some guru or something, and the man only had one word to, to tell him, and that was the just shall live by faith. And that's when he began to see that I can't do this on my own. I can't do this on no works. I got to have faith in you. The same way I got saved is the same way I get sanctified by having faith in you. I will never find within me the ability to stand upright and to do everything have to come from God. And I understand that now, Brief, because God ain't going to have no man to boast in front of him and he ain't going to share his glory. Whatever that you got that's good, you're going to have to say the Lord did it. I, I, I didn't do none of this. And so all of this stuff that they give us, Lady Deborah, that mess us up in church, telling us, telling us something, you need to make up your mind. How many times I done make, I done made up my mind many times I done made a bed up. I, had, I, done had more, I done had more success making a bed up than making my mind up. Because the things I say I don't do, I say, you know, I, I get proud when I make it about six months or seven months or eight months, but you done made your mind up, it ain't gonna happen no more. Look what he says here in verse 5. This is the difference between Paul's message, the mystery, and the prophetic mystery. He says, but to him that worketh not. See, you find rest. He's our Sabbath. I find rest in him. I've been doing my best. I've been trying. I ain't talking to nobody that don't want to do no better. I'm talking about somebody that really, really, with their heart, they really love God and they want to. But he says, but to him that worketh not but believe if on him. You see, when I'm working, my, my attention is on me. My attention is on me. But when I believe, my attention is on him. Everything, every good and perfect gift come from him. Ain't nothing coming from me. The only reason that a person ain't doing so good is because they got their focus on themselves. And the reason a person is doing better is because they got their focus on God. It's just as simple as that. 
He says, not to him that worketh, but to him that believeth on him that does what? That justifies the ungodly. Justify means that ain't nothing wrong with you. Justify is saying is that you, you ain't got spot, wrinkle, or no such thing. God can justify the ungodly without your work. His faith is counted for righteousness. We got a long way to go. Clap your hands for the Lord. Yeah.